mean, you have to understand this. For the Irish media, it's almost a badge of honour not to talk about this stuff. It's seen as a mark of low status. Um, it, it's high status to cover up the news um, when, yes. it, when it comes to this yeah. kind of thing. And it's low status to even deign to acknowledge it. Hi, everyone. This is Anne of the Anne and Phelan Scoop. This is the Anne and Phelan Scoop, but just Anne at the moment. Phelan is in Ireland. Um, so it's kind of a transatlantic uh, scoop this week. But you'll be hearing from Phelan. You'll be hearing from Phelan later on. As you can see, it's very cold here still. And that's actually kind of an interesting thought I've just had recently, you know, because climate change is real, right? So there's absolutely no doubt that climate change is real. You know, the question is, to what extent is it man-made, if even at all man-made? But it does change climate changes. And I just had a very funny thought here recently. Imagine if the climate that's in Ireland normally was suddenly in California and the Californian SoCal beautiful weather went to Ireland. And it's not that um, beyond the bounds of possibility. Anything's possible. This last weekend, look at look at these charts. It was warmer in the west of Ireland than it was here. So I want my money back because we're paying a lot of money to live here. Um, and the only reason people stay is because of the weather and if the weather goes away. So basically, we now we're on to, what, three, four months nearly of of this weather that is just not... And it's funny, all the people who talk so much about climate change, they don't talk so much about this weird thing that's just happened in California and that is not stopping. And as I said, we've had this cold weather for far, far too long. Anyway, what else are we doing today in the show? So I'll be showing you just how bad the BBC are at this journalism game. And we need to pay attention to the trans contagion. I have a few questions you can ask anyone who's selling that particular snake oil nonsense. And I have a delightful and super simple little recipe. And as I said earlier, Phelan will be, or maybe I didn't say that earlier, Phelan will be talking later in the programme to John McGurk because Phelan is not the only person who is in Ireland at the moment or who was in Ireland in the last few days. As you know, President Joe Biden was in Ireland. You know, we'll be asking Phelan a few questions about the mainstream media in Ireland and how they have covered this story. And maybe some of the stories that weren't covered here and that people didn't hear about, about this visit of Joe Biden and his first son, Hunter Biden, who also went on that trip. But first... Did any of you see the most delightful interview between Elon Musk and a journalist from the BBC? Extraordinary, absolute gold um, for a number of reasons. Um, So the BBC emailed Elon Musk asking for an interview and his response was, let's do it tonight. So instantly he said, yeah, let's just do this. So without saying anything more, I'm just going to share with you the first clip from this interview. It's just about two minutes long and it's just delightful. Let's have a watch. Content you don't like or or hateful? What do you mean to describe a hateful thing? Yeah, I mean, you know, just content that will solicit a a reaction, something that may include something that is slightly racist or slightly sexist, those kinds of those kinds of things. So you think if something is slightly sexist, it should be banned? I, no, is that I'm, what not, you're saying? I'm not saying anything. I'm saying. Well, I'm just curious. What you, I'm, I'm trying to understand what you mean by hateful con- content, and I'm asking for specific examples. Um, and if, and you just said that if something is slightly sexist, that's hateful content. And does that mean that it should be banned? Well, you've asked me. You've asked me whether my feed, whether it's got less or more. It, I'd say it's got slightly more. That's why I'm asking for examples. Can, right. you, can you name one example? I, I honestly don't. I, I, honestly, I you don't, can't name I, a single example. I'll tell you why. Because I don't actually use that for you feed anymore. Because I, I just don't particularly like it. But you actually, said you, a lot of people. A lot of people are quite similar. I, I, I only. Well, well, I only look well at hang my, on a second. You said you've seen more hateful content, but you can't name a single example. Not even one. I'm not sure I've used that feed for the last three or four weeks. And I, well, I, then I how did you I, see the hateful content? content? Because I've been I've been using I've been using Twitter since you've taken it over for the last six months. Okay, so then you must have at some point seen the you, for you hateful content. I'm asking for one example. Right. And you I, can't I, give a single I, one. And, I, and I'm saying I, I, then I, I say so that you don't know what you're talking about. Really? Yes, because you can't give me a single example of hateful con- content, not even one tweet, and yet you claimed that the hateful content was high. Well, that's a false. No, what I claimed, you just lied. What no no what I claim was. Uh, there are many uh, organizations that say that that kind of information is on the rise. Now, whether whether it has on my feed or not, 
I mean, I, right, and Literally if you look at something one. like the, the uh, Strategic Dialogue uh, Institute in the, U in the UK, they will say that. So you, they, Look, it's, people will say all sorts of nonsense. I'm literally asking for a right. single example, and you can't name one. Right, and as, as I've already said, I don't use that feed. But let's, well, then how let, would you know? Then, that I don't you, think this is getting anywhere. You literally said you experienced more hateful content and then couldn't name a single example. Right, and as I said, I, That's haven't, absurd. I, haven't, I haven't actually looked at that feed. I then how would you know there's hateful content? Because I'm saying that's what I saw a few weeks ago. I can't give you an exact example. Let's move on. We, have, we only have a certain amount of time. Um, wow. So there we have it. So there's a, hate, there's a rise in hateful content on Twitter. And Elon Musk says to the journalist, give me an example. And the journalist hymns and haws. And anyway, eventually, as you heard, Elon Musk says, you just lied. And he did just lie because he couldn't give one example. And what's really delightful about this, by the way, and then oh, I love the journalist, the journalist, you know, James Clayton, let's move on. But before I move on from this clip, it's good to stop and ask yourself, who exactly is James Clayton, this guy who was asked this question about social media, was asked this question about hateful comment on Twitter? And the interesting thing about James Clayton from the BBC is that James Clayton is the BBC North America tech reporter. Yeah, I'll just repeat that. He's the BBC North America tech reporter. So he's actually somebody who I would imagine, I suppose we'd have the expectation that he might know something about tech or that he wouldn't talk complete nonsense or he wouldn't just say stuff that was hearsay. That hearsay wouldn't be something that the tech reporter, that the tech expert for the BBC wouldn't get involved with. But you know what? That's exactly what he did. Um, and it's anyway, I love I love that. But it's not the only quote from this. The second part of this that I just thought was fantastic was this this next this next little section um, from James Clayton again speaking with Elon Musk in this interview that just happened in the last few days. Um, let's have a listen to this piece. Does the BBC uh, hold itself at all responsible for misinformation re regarding ma masking and, and side effects of vaccinations and not reporting on that at all? And what about the fact that the BBC was put under pressure by the British government to change its editorial policy? Are you aware of that? This is, a, this is not an interview about the BBC. Oh, so. you thought it wasn't? <laughs> and this, I see now why you've done Twitter Spaces. I am not a representative of the BBC's editorial policy. I want to make that clear. Let's talk about something else. You want I'm to talk about the BBC. You too. All right, let's, 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 talk about, let's talk about something else. You weren't expecting that. Let's talk about something else. Delightful. So there you have it. Um, you know, there's Elon Musk, you know, who this isn't what he does for a living, you know, being interviewed speaking to the journalist, speaking to the journalistic expert, the media expert who can't answer the simplest of questions. And once Elon Musk turns the tables on him and points out the fact that the, that B, the BBC is not even slightly impartial and in fact during COVID was obviously taking instruction from the UK government and spreading misinformation, disinformation about masks and the you know side effects of vaccines weren't actually covering the fact that there were some side effects to the, to the vaccines that weren't being reported on. Um, and once that happens, you know, the response, the response of the BBC journalist is, well, you know, I don't speak for the BBC and, you know, we're going to move on. We're just going to move on. So I think what was really brilliant about this exchange is um, seeing you know, these kind of people, this mainstream media being being called out in real time. How just absolutely delightful. So I just was checking on who James Clayton was. And when I was doing that, I was looking at his own th thread and his own Twitter feed. So, you know, as you can imagine, this interview was pretty extraordinary for a number of reasons. And I've just pointed out those two particular reasons to you. Now, you'd imagine it would behove. I like that word, behove. It would behove may not even be a proper word, but I'm going to go use it anyway. It sounds kind of good and a little bit Shakespearean. You know, look at me being all kinds of sophisticated. It behoves the mainstream media to point out this extraordinary interview, to highlight this interview, to highlight the fact that the, that the BBC's tech reporter doesn't seem to know anything about tech. Um, however, what's very interesting is, and the work was done for me by James Clayton. Thanks a million, James Clayton. James Clayton has highlighted, actually, how the media reported on this extraordinary interview. And it's just delightful. So here's, here's, the, here's the headlines from the mainstream media's response to that. What a crazy interview. So many lines I thought I'd do. First up, the New York Times. So the New York Times focused on the emotional strain of running Twitter has been painful. 
according to Elon Musk. That's that's what they decided to focus on. The Washington Post on Musk sleeping on a couch at Twitter and how his dog is in charge. That's what the Washington Post thought was important to highlight. The Guardian. Oh, The Guardian. Just delightful. The Guardian. They went with on how Musk said he would change a BBC Twitter label to publicly funded, which he's now done. Um, Yes, Musk, by the way, did change the label on BBC to publicly funded because the BBC is publicly funded. Yeah. Oh, the shock, the horror. Reuters decided to go with Musk said he was unaware whether Indian government had asked for it to pull BBC Modi dock. Um, CNN went with Elon Musk says he's cut about 80% of Twitter's staff. The Independent on being forced to buy Twitter. Elon Musk says he never wanted Twitter, but there's no way out for him now. And Bloomberg on his comments that some advertisers are back, but not all of them. Elon Musk's troll heaven turned Twitter in a, into an advertiser's hell. So it's just an interesting thing, you know, the mainstream media. I mean, th- there was an actual story there through that interview that Elon Musk did with BBC. There was a real story there. The real story was the story, actually, about James Clayton, a tech journalist who doesn't know anything about tech. That's a story that's worth reporting. However, all the mainstream media decided to report on something else. Oh, look, over there. Oh, look, over there. Any kind of distraction away from the COVID misinformation of the BBC or from the BBC's own incompetent journalist. Um... And that's, you know, and that is, I suppose, in a way, a reason why we do what we do, why we are the Unreported Story Society. And by the way, quick plug, don't forget to send your donations. We have a matching donor at the moment, matching up to $50,000. And we would really like to achieve, uh, to be able to match all of that. Um, Just amazing. Just amazing. Just uh, embarrassing. And of course, Jim Clayton says nothing, of course, in his Twitter feed about his own very embarrassing outing by, by Elon Musk. Talking of our matching campaign, as you know, you probably re- you may have received a letter from us recently um, that where we talked about a trans story that we are going to do, that we are going to be, you know, for some of you, it's important because some of you actually have this happening quite close to home. So I would imagine quite a number of you have someone perhaps in your extended family who has been affected by this, or you've got a friend or a relative, or you have... You've heard about it in the workplace. If there's somebody out there who hasn't got some connection with this story, you're connected with this story and you need to be attentive and you need to be involved in exposing this. I mean, this is, this has to be almost the, I think the worst, possibly the worst medical um, scandal of all time. I mean, I, this, this even goes beyond, this goes beyond COVID as far as I'm concerned, much, much beyond COVID. Um, and interestingly, at the weekend, someone, um, one of our supporters sent me an article from Substack that Dr. Robert Malone had written about rapid onset gender dysphoria, ROGD it's called. And I had a quick look at that. And by the way, I'm going to put the, the whole link to his Substack article in the notes. But I pulled out a few pieces from this that I thought, um, you know, are important for people to everyone to know about and everyone to get engaged in and everyone to have as almost like a piece of weaponry when you are accused of being transphobic or the rest of it um you know and why is it that um the right and conservatives are you know are taking this on as an issue um with such ferocity and and it, it no ferocity is enough to to fight against this this is this is literally and i mean really literally demonic what's going on. Um, So in um, Dr. Malone's article, he quotes from a Psychology Today 2018 article. And I'm going to read a little bit of this and and just point out a few of the pieces. And again, the piece that Dr. Malone wrote is quite long and I, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to deal with all of it. And as I said, but I want to quote a few pieces. So he quotes, as I said, from this um, 2018 Psychology Today article, where it says, in a recent survey of 250 families, whose children, and this is back in 2018, whose children developed symptoms of gender dysphoria during or right after puberty, Lisa Littman, a physician and professor of behavioural science at Brown University, found that over 80% of the youth in her sample were female at birth. So there's your first, you know, red flag. So this condition, this madness, this contagion affects girls dramatically more than boys you know there's a question mark there right away there's a there's a red flag right away that 
that people should be answering and being attentive to. There's something going on here that's happening more to girls than to boys. Why would that be? Littman's study reported many other surprising findings. To meet the diagnostic criteria for gender dysphoria, a child typically needs to have shown observable characteristics of the condition prior to puberty, such as a strong rejection of typical female or masculine toys or a strong resistance to wearing typically feminine or masculine clothes. And again, this is again from this study. 80% of the parents in the study reported observing none of these early signs in their children. Littman hypothesizes that rapid onset gender dysphoria can be cast as a maladaptive coping mechanism. So I think this is really significant. For other underlying mental health issues such as trauma, or social maladjustment, but also for other exceptional traits traits like high IQ or giftedness. So this is quite interesting. And she, you know, and, and we have heard through other studies as well, that very often the cohort who are identifying as transgender have had some trauma, have had some quite significant mental health issue, or they're actually ex- has, have some kind of an um, exceptionally high IQ or giftedness, which is already separating them from their, from the rest of the gang and making them feel a bit awkward, perhaps. I'm going to again read again from, and this is from the Psychology uh, 2018 article, which is quoting from, from, this, from this study from Brown. The peer support, prestige and identity leveraged by the youth who proudly come out as trans certainly appears to be protective in their circles. As Littman's study shows, this social signalling strategy also comes with a strong disadvantage particularly as it increases conflict between trans youth and the cis, that means the ordinary, the regular majority of the population, which tellingly includes a majority of the LGBT community. So the other very disturbing piece of information that I got from Dr. Malone's article is where he he tells us about um, an update to the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Disorders, 5th edition, 2013. He quotes from that, published by the American Psychiatric Association, where they said the prevalence, again, just remember the year 2013, where they said, they said the prevalence rate of gender dysphoria is between 0.005% to 0.014% for males and 0.002% to 0.003% for females. So, you know, that seems like a very small number. That is like way in both cases for boys and girls significantly less than 1%. Fast forward. So that was again 2013. Fast forward to 2022. Pew Research puts that rate at 5% of all young adults. About 5% of young adults in the US say their gender is different from their sex assigned at birth. 5%. So, and again, this is Dr. Malone. So we're all clear. The above ratio difference between 2013 and 2022 argue that the rapid onset gender dysphoria outlined in Psychology Today has increased the rate of adults who identify as trans from a number less than 1% to 5%. You know, we have to ask the question, what has happened to increase that so dramatically in such a very short period of time? Let's, let's just dig into that number just slightly. So in 2021, there are a total of 64.5 million adolescents in the United States. 4% of that number would be 2.58 million people who now have rapid onset gender dysphoria. That is over 2.5 million people who now believe, based on a groupthink, groupthink, mass formation and social media trends, that they were born to the wrong sex. You know, this is extraordinary and one of the other lines that really struck me in Dr Malone's article was that he said that parents you know are being called that uh, the parents that he you know that have been spoken to by by these researchers are being derogatorily described by their by their children as breeders being r- routinely harassed by their children who played pronoun police 
The observation that they no longer recognised their child's voice came up again and again in parental reports. I really like this particular section. So parents are reporting that they don't recognise their children's voice anymore. And I, I know of a story, and I, I, this is why I, kind of, I really want to highlight this, because I'm wondering if any of you have experienced this. So you're starting to hear a child speak in a way that's like really weird. And here's what uh, in the Dr. Malone piece he has. In turn, the eerie similarity between the youth's discourse and trans-positive online content was repeatedly emphasised. Youth were described as sounding scripted, reading from a script, wooden, like a form letter, verbatim, word for word, or practically copy and paste. So, I mean, one thing that's for sure that's happened in the intervening period is that social media, has, you know, is more and more um, a, f- a feature. And I don't know, I think I mentioned it in a recent podcast, but I spoke at YAF um, at the Young America's Foundation up in Santa Barbara recently and met, you know, all these delightful young people that were there, really fabulous young people. And, you know, I said to, I, I said to a few of them, and I think I did say this before in this, on the podcast, but it's worth saying again. I said to a few of them, and these were kind of older teenagers, you know, about to graduate high school. And uh, I said to them, you know, oh, you can follow me on Twitter. You, you know, I'm on, I'm on all the social media. And at least three of them said to me in a row, Oh, I have no, I don't have a phone. I don't have any social media. I don't have any, I don't have Facebook. I don't have Twitter. And I thought, and my response to them was, this is like the best thing I've ever heard. What a favor. What a brilliant thing to never, to never be on social media because it's, the good it does, you know, which it might do, whatever, is outweighed certainly for young people by the damage, by the danger. And, you know, the unregulated nature of it is, extraordinary and uh, if anyone ever wants to upset themselves and shock themselves you know look at some of this trans content that's on um that's on TikTok it is extraordinarily disturbing including um an account by a doctor called Sive Gallagher who's Irish and who's operating out of Florida and um I again deeply ex- deeply disturbing content um where she playfully and joyously and manically and oddly and weirdly and very unmedically and very unscientifically and very unprofessionally you know is dancing around with these young people who she's just done double mastectomies on and has these photographs of it um and it's it's extraordinary and of course she's making a fortune and you know I'm I don't know what's happening with governor Don, Ron Santos on this issue but um I'd like to think that she'll be out of business soon the problem is she'll find plenty of other places to go um but there is something and you know and we all need to be you know to be alert to not because I realize this more and more that the left do they do a great job of co-opting language or owning language and we and we allow that to happen and we find ourselves I think some of us um, find ourselves saying stuff that we should like top surgery there's no such thing as top surgery just it doesn't even exist as a phrase it is a double mastectomy you know on on a healthy on healthy limbs and healthy healthy organs healthy parts of a body and the fact that the medical establishment is all rowing in on this and not speaking out on this every last part of the medical establishment is frightening. Um, I'd say the one thing that I can for sure kind of compare it to um, that was equally demonic is um, eugenics, um, where the medical establishment pretty much all, you know, caved in on that and thought it was a marvellous idea. And then we had um, Auschwitz, you know, then we had the Holocaust um, because, well, the Americans, you know, came up with the whole eugenics idea, promoted it, popularised it, you know, it became super popular here. And the Germans, you know, Hitler found a great use for it, um, using science, science, by the way, you know, so, you know, follow the science, you know. Yeah, I think COVID has done one one thing for sure about follow the science. If, if, if climate change hadn't done it, this is, you know, it's done. Anyway, that's all very disturbing and it is very disturbing. And I think a lot of us and I'm putting myself as a lot of us, I've got this is us. This is me. You know, I my instincts are to run as fast as I can away from this trans issue because I find it really, really disturbing. I find it like it's very disturbing. Um, and I don't even have children. And um, there are parents all over the world and it's all over the world. This um, facing this demonic situation, this very, very frightening situation, finding a child in your house that you don't recognize anymore that is telling you that there's something else. And 
you know, we we have to all engage with this. We can't run away from this. We all have to engage and we have to ca- call these people out every time. Why has there been this sudden increase uh, in this very short period of time? Why is this girls? Why is it that this cohort of people identifying in this way? And I didn't say that before, but I mean, it's in all of the literature. Very, very, very high percentage um, are autistic or have some other condition. Um, you know, we, we need to be engaged in this. We can't. And so please, um, we are doing a project on this this year and we do have this matching donor. And I would ask you to please help us out. Anything that you give will be immediately doubled. Um, and you can you can donate online at unreportedstorysociety.com and we'll put up all the links. We'll make it very easy for you to donate. So please do. Um, I want to do a happy thing now before we go over to Phelan's interview with John McGurk. Um, I have recently, this is really changing tack now, you talk about a segue. Um, I have really recently discovered kale and uh, it's like the biggest joy of my life in the recent past. I don't know if sometimes food can be just such a joy, but kale is amazing. I just cannot get over kale. And for those of you who know all about kale, you know, um, you're going to be, you know, rolling your eyes at this point. But I have obviously learned just recently about the fact that kale needs to be massaged. Massaged is the word they use, right? You know, forget that. You don't, mis- whatever. It needs to be, it needs to be marinated, basically. Um, it needs, so it's, it's one of those salads where the dressing goes on in advance and quite a lot of time in advance. And it's just an amazing salad. It's got everything right about it. Because I think one of the things about salads is crunchiness is very important. I think crunchiness in general in life is very important. People like crunch. So I'm going to share just this particular dressing I found to use with a kale salad. And I just had this. I was on my lonesome and I had a lovely piece of salmon. And it made me think actually of Judith Jones, the famous um, editor, extremely famous editor, by the way, the very famous editor who is the woman who discovered the Diary of Anne Frank, which all these publishing publishing houses had rejected. And she was the one who spotted it and said, we have to publish this um, for Knopf, I think it was at the time. Um, Judith Jones, she then famously went on to be the person who discovered Julia Childs. And obviously that was a publishing sensation for the, for the publishing house. But when she got older, she lived alone. And she wrote a very delightful book, which I just bought for a friend of mine called something like eating, you know, the delights of eating for one. I'll find the title and I'll put it up. You'll see a a screenshot of it there. Judith Jones. Why am I mentioning Judith Jones? Oh, yes, because I was eating on my own and I had a fabulous piece of salmon. Such a perfect, uh, anyway, perfect, perfect salmon and a perfect salad. And I have to say, I was all delighted with myself. There's a picture of my plate. How delightful is that? So here's the ingredients in this salad dressing. Half a cup of extra virgin olive oil, one third of a cup of apple cider vinegar, quarter of a cup of honey, two teaspoons of balsamic vinegar. I think that's one of the tricks with this is the two different types of vinegar. One teaspoon of Dijon mustard, two cloves of garlic and a pinch of salt. And all of that, you know, whiz that up. Um, I actually put it into the into the blender and whiz that up. And, you know, it'll give you more than you need, particularly if you're eating just for one. And then into that salad, I just used um, a bag of kale that I got, um, a little bag of prepared kale that I got uh, in Costco. But obviously, if you're buying kale, you want to just get rid of the heavy, that very you know, that very, very thick um, stem and then just have the leaf, if you like, and cut it up nice and small. And then adding to that, again, I added some, I add, to this particular one that you can see in the picture, I added some chopped up hazelnuts. I just love hazelnuts. Got a big bag in Costco. So some chopped up hazelnuts. I also put in there some, a bit of um, goat's cheese. And what else did I put in there? Um Oh, just bits and pieces of anything that you find that you really like in your own kitchen. Um, maybe some spring onion, but either way, this was just a delight. Oh, the other thing very important is um, an apple and use a sweet apple. I actually, funny, didn't have a sweet apple and I used a Granny Smith. But you know what? Delightful. Really, really yummy. So if you want to eat something really fun and very just fresh and delightful and eat that and uh, the salmon that you see there obviously super super simple I got that little steak little salmon steak um, in in Trader Joe's dry it pepper and salt and it basically I think I think I have it down really right here on a quite hot pan with butter basically five minutes and then three minutes on the other side um you know, and I like it like that. I don't like it overdone. I always think that, you know, that the one disadvantage of fish is that, you know, overdone and it's dreadful. 
And it was just gorgeous. And I ate that on my lonesome and just thought of friends and family far away. So we're going to go over right now to Phelan's interview with uh, John McGurk, who, you know, who is a wonderful journalist who is doing the really hard work in Ireland because, again, the mainstream media there, like the mainstream media here, um, you know, they couldn't, you know, to save their lives, they couldn't find a news story if they really wanted to. They, they, they just can't find a news story to save their lives because they're so obsessed with the narrative, with the liberal narrative that they want to push all the time. So let's hear what John McGurk thought of Joe Biden's visit to Ireland. So I'm joined now by John McGurk uh, of uh, the brilliant website Gripped.ie um, to discuss um, the American exodus to, into Ireland uh, of both Joe Biden, Hunter Biden, I think there was a sister Biden, and now we've got the Clintons as well, hot off the presses. The Clintons are there now, the Bidens have left, and the Clintons. I'm not sure that's a fair deal. But um, he received an enormously warm welcome, let's be quite honest, uh, an, an enormously warm welcome to Ireland. Um, there are many things to be discussed about it. Um, uh, I, so welcome to the show, John. Thanks for having me, Phelan, as always. It's great to be here. Just tell me, how was the welcome? I, I mean, I watched it from a distance. I'm in Ireland now, but I watched uh, his welcome from a distance. Tell me, how, how was the welcome? Rapturous is the only word to describe it. I mean, you've got to realize that here in Ireland, there, there are a couple of factors at play. Number one, it's still a big deal for us as a small country to welcome a U.S. president, but it's a particular big deal to us to welcome somebody who, whether you like the guy or not, and I wouldn't be his biggest fan in the world, nor I suspect would you, whether you like him or not, he very self-consciously publicly identifies himself as Irish and Catholic, um, describes yes. himself as an Irishman. And, you know, sure, that's a delight for us here. Delight to have yes. somebody saying yes. that they're, they're, one of, you know, they're, they're, they're one of ours returned home. So that was an element mm -hmm. of it. There's also the element, frankly, uh, that this is particularly at the media level and at the sort of Irish establishment level, the most progressive left wing middle country in the world. Um, and so the idea that this is the great conqueror of Donald Trump arriving to share his wisdom with us um, probably adds a little bit of free song. Because, you know, yes. I, 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 the Irish American thing only explains so much. Kevin McCarthy is a proud Irish American. He's a speaker of the House of Representatives. And I don't think he would have received quite the same level of adulation had he arrived mm -hmm. here. Um, I would say for your, I, I just want to say this point. I would say for your, for, for your viewers who, who might be American and wondering if we've all gone mad in Ireland, that for an awful lot of people, this isn't about politics. There's an awful lot of people who, who wouldn't understand the intricacies of, you know, what Biden is doing in relation mm -hmm. to religious rights in the U.S. or the transgender issues we saw this week or mm -hmm. any issues that concern American people. As far as the ordinary Irish person is just concerned, he's the president, he's a good guy, we like him, he's Irish, we welcome him. But as far as the Irish establishment are concerned, I think there's a degree of reveling in this idea that, you know, there's a progressive Irishman in charge and so therefore the red carpet gets rolled out. But to be fair uh, to Joe Biden, which is words I you know, don't come naturally to me, um, and to be fair to the Irish people, which are also words that don't come naturally to me either, um, you know, there is something magical about the Irish president coming to Ireland. I mean, I remember Bill Clinton coming to Northern Ireland. I think it was the first visit by a president to Northern Ireland. Um, and I was a cynical Irish news journalist at the time. And, you know, even Bill Clinton melted me. I mean, which is, you know, but, you know, Bill was quite a performer. It was a very historic occasion. And it was a party, too. It was a great party. It was a fantastic party. Um, you know, you were running around Belfast, uh, the Secret Service guys, there was media, it was just all the pubs were full, you know, and uh, uh, it was it was a party. And I, and I think that's it was that element was he came to small towns, he came to big towns, he came to places that maybe don't get as much uh, publicity, and they really, they really, as you say, a lot of them aren't particularly political. The establishment, which is very, very ultra progressive, liked him because he's not Donald Trump, um, and uh, that all added into you know, hail glorious Saint Joe Biden. 
There's one other factor as well, I think, Phelan, which is important to mention in that Clinton and Biden have something in common which works well in Ireland, which is that they're both from very small states. Clinton, an Arkansas native, uh, Biden represented Delaware in the Senate, uh, as we know, for 30, 40, 50, 70 years, however long it was. Um, yeah. And therefore, their style of politics meshes very well with Ireland, which is a very small country. So one of the things Joe Biden was very good at this week, whether you like him or not, was pressing the flesh, kissing babies, yes. kissing grannies. Yes. Uh, very, very naturally good at it in a way that somebody like George W. Bush, coming from Texas, yeah. where more your politics is on TV, doesn't naturally mesh with that style. Um, and so yes. and so when, when Biden comes here, that's a big element of his appeal. And it's a big element of his political appeal in the US. I think his opponents sometimes underestimate. Um, his yeah, yeah, yeah. One on one, he's very good. Yeah, well, Clinton Clinton was the, was the king of that mm. as well. I mean, he's very very charismatic as well. And by the way, so is Trump, of course. But that we're not supposed to talk about that. Like Trump, <laughs> Trump could talk to Trump could talk to anyone. I mean, mm. he literally could talk to anyone. Uh, you know, and we I would spend forty five minutes with him, and you know, he he just talked. He just talks away. He could talk to anyone about anything. Um, and uh, but we're not supposed to acknowledge that, you know. We're supposed well, to well, I, 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 I know that it might be an advantage for him in the campaign against DeSantis because DeSantis, of course, governor of a big state. I've seen a lot of pieces recently saying he's more stilted in formal settings than Trump is. Oh, yeah, not as good at pressing the flesh. So that'll be an interesting battle to watch play out. But we're a bit off topic. Oh, yeah. Well, I haven't, I haven't met DeSantis, I have met Trump, and I've met people who've met DeSantis, DeSantis and I think stilted is kind to him, mm -hmm. right. I think he's ultra stilted. He's, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's, he's an introvert actually, you know, and uh, that's not, you don't want to put an introvert up against Donald Trump. Uh, mm. I, you know, uh, it's hard to beat at the best of times, but with someone who's not good at, 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 at repartee or the quick one liner, I'll tell you, uh, you know, Donald Trump, you know, it, it, Donald Trump will be a formidable op opponent. So Hunter was with Joe this week mm. Um, I suppose, look, you know, Irish investigative journalism, journalism and opinion columnists, they're, they're world renowned. Fenton O'Toole, I'm sure there was lots of pe people, party poopers, you know, <laughs> highlighting Hunter's links to communist China. How he got three, he got three million from the mayor of Moscow's wife. I mean, he ran, he ran, a, he was on the board of a pro-Russian oil and gas company in the Ukraine, right? So obviously. You know, you always get these people who sit in the corner throwing rocks. I'm sure there was all that all over the Irish media this week. <laughs> no, there wasn't. There wasn't a single mention of anything like that, Phil. I know you'll be shocked. Um, in fact, yes. I, have to, I have to say his, his, his presence got almost no attention, other than the fact that it was maybe mentioned in passing that he was uh, accompanied by his son. Of course, there was a, a very, um, the media was much more interested in his other son, the, the late, um, sadly departed, Bo because of a, mm -hmm. a, a moment a moment where uh, the president met with uh, apparently a retired chaplain who had performed the last rites on Bo Biden when he lost his life mm -hmm. in the army. But Hunter, the less honourable son, shall we say, uh, his presence yes. was noted, I think, in passing by the Irish Times. Uh, and there was, I mean, there was a lot of stuff online. I mean, there are a lot of Irish people who read the internet, a lot of Irish people who watch your podcast or have yeah. seen the movie. Um, yeah. And we don't go along with the official narrative who were making these points on social media, but um, it's almost a badge of honor. I mean, you have to understand this. For the Irish media, it's almost a badge of honor not to talk about this stuff. It will be yes. seen as it, it's it's a, it's seen as a mark of low status. Um, it, it's high status to cover up the news. Um, when, yes, when it comes to this yeah. kind of thing, and it's low status to even deign to acknowledge it. Now, yes, uh, you know. It, the, the easiest thing in the world to say is that Hunter Biden's name were Hunter Trump. Um, the Irish media's yes. attitude would be different, but I mean, you know that that's yes. the same on both sides of the Atlantic, right? So it's it's yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny you talk about that low status and high status, and it was something that I that it's always struck me about the, the anti-Trump sentiment. Funny, so much of it is based in snobbery. I think mm. you know he's not one of us. You know he uh, he's, he doesn't speak the same way. He, you know, I remember when when he was elected. I think it was the Washington Post ran a piece on Melania, and the, she was going to be the first lady who could who would buy her clothes off the rack. Mm. The horror, the humanity, 
right? Mm -hmm. That she wouldn't be going to designer. She could because I I don't I don't know much about women's shopping clothes, etc. But I think if you've got the figure that Milani is, you can walk into a shop and buy pretty much anything uh, off the rack. And they were saying this, but it was it was said in such a way as, as a criticism that she wouldn't have you know be in designer gear. You know, there's there's a snobbery there that that is kind of the untold story of, of the Trump's presidency. Um, one thing I, you said there, there was a moving moment when he met the priest who gave Bo the last rites. He met him at, at Knock Shrine, uh, where the Virgin Mary appeared 150 years ago, uh, or a bit more. And he also spoke at Ballina Cathedral. Now, my friends from the north were a different kind up there. Actually, I was up there at the weekend, and a lot of Trump supporters up there on both sides of the of the aisle, actually, Catholic and Protestant, um, more than you'd think. And uh, uh, there was a sign on a bridge there in Uri, go home, Provo Joe, right? And now, to, to, say, to tell our people in America, Provo Joe is the provisional IRA. Joe, of course, would be, Joe would have a, kind of an anti-British sensibility, Irish-American, you know, pro-nationalist sensibility. But I would say the sign should have read, go home, aborto Joe, um, because, you know, their religion, you know, the religion of progressivism, abortion is, it seems to be the sacrament, the, 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 moment, the statement of their progressivism. And, you know, no, Joe's really a man for no abortion left behind, mm. and uh, he came to Ireland, which was I think the first country in the world to vote for abortion in a referendum. Um, but you know they're entitled to their opinions, as they say. Uh, but what the heck was Knock Shrine and Ballina Cathedral doing, letting a Bordeaux Joe? within 50 metres of it or 50 yards, whatever you Irish people say. Well, we could have a whole conversation about the state of the Roman church in Ireland uh, when it comes to that particular issue. I mean, we had, as you mentioned a moment ago, we had an abortion referendum here in 2018 um, where the Roman Catholic Church might have been expected uh, to line up wholly and entirely um, in the opposition camp. Mm -hmm. And it didn't. But large parts of it did. I don't want to make people think that the Roman church was out... Roman Catholic Church was out campaigning for abortion. It wasn't, but there were one or two priests who quite openly indicated or hinted strongly, some very prominent ones, that they thought maybe, you know, compassion and kindness might lead people to think carefully about how they'd vote. They weren't saying vote no. Mm -hmm. um, the Irish Catholic Church is a, is a, is a beaten dog. Uh, and I, I, I say that as somebody who loves dog, loves dogs and hates the thought of them, <laughs> but it's, it's cowering in the corner. It's afraid... Yeah. It's afraid of being criticized. Um, this idea that religion should be in tune with society is dominant here. This, um, that, 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 that the religion should reflect the society rather than the societies reflect the values of the religion. That, that is entirely taken mm -hmm. over. So we have a, a Roman Catholic church here that, that, you know, again, no bishop would ever dream of denying communion to a politician because of their views on abortion. Would they be mortified? I mean, and, and mortified is, that's the way I think people need to think about it. They would be embarrassed to be thought one of those people. Um, one of those people. I mean, there's a, there's a, if your viewers have never watched, there's a really excellent British sitcom from the 1980s called Yes Minister, which really explains British politics. Yes. There's a scene in it where the prime minister is appointing a bishop and, uh, He's, he says, um, why can't we appoint this one? And the, the fellow says, well, there's a problem. He believes in God. Um, th yes. this, uh, this idea that a, 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 a bishop would be more loyal to the fundamental views of his faith rather than sort of social mores of the society that he lives in, that, that's, that, that's apostasy here in Ireland. You, you cannot have no. that. Our, our Catholic Church, I say this all the time, and... I have some Catholic friends who'd be annoyed that I say it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It is, it is the Anglican Church of Henry VIII. It is, it, 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 you know, I always think Henry VIII of England, who of course abolished Roman Catholicism in England, tried to do it here in Ireland, he suppressed all the monasteries, and we fought him for fought him and his successors for hundreds of years for the the one true faith. Mm. The average Irish Catholic is now more Anglican in their thinking than the Anglicans themselves. 
So, uh, you know, what, what yeah. distinguishes those two religions? Attitudes to divorce, attitudes to abortion, attitudes to the to the, whether the sacrament is the, the blood and body of Jesus Christ. I mean, mm. The average Irish Catholic, I think, is much closer in their views and outlook to, to the Anglican Church than they are to the Church of Rome. And so it doesn't surprise me at all that Joe Biden got a huge welcome at knock. Um, I, 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 it would be astonishing if he didn't. And by the way, had they had they for a moment said, oh, no, you can't come here because of your views on abortion, that there would have been holy war in Ireland against them. They wouldn't have, they wouldn't have lasted a week. I mean, their, their own their own faithful would have risen up against them because that, kind, well, of, that but, kind of stuff doesn't. I mean, it doesn't, I'm sorry. I know you might think I'm overstating it, Phelan, but I'm not. No, no, I'm not. No, I don't think you're overstating it. I, I'm just thinking. Do they not? Well, what's the point in having a church if it's not full of Catholics? I mean, and, and I mean that in in a positive way, isn't it? Wouldn't they be better? To, 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 to hit the headlines, make a moral stand in a world where people are looking for meaning, give, give people meaning, mm -hmm. uh, I, give people something. Well, I, I, I agree with you. I, I think that, um, I, I, by the way, I should say that I have spoken to, and I do know there are a lot, a lot of Catholics in Ireland who are very hurt and upset by what happened last week. Mm -hmm. Uh, and do think it made a mockery of their faith that somebody who, as far as I'm aware, believes in abortion right up to the moment of birth, uh, if not in all circumstances, then in then in a great broad set of circumstances, would be welcomed as a returning hero to a to a Marian shrine. There are a lot of Catholics who are hurt about that. Um, but as regards the church, you know, I think we have a. a an issue and it's not just in ireland with a generation of priests who are sort of i mean if you think of the age they are they're children yeah. of the 60s um they are people in the mold of um they're, they're, they're people who believe to be the most charitable i can be to them that the, the the church needs to reflect the modern world and that its values are not eternal yeah. but the eternal object is the church to survive i think that's the view and i suppose if you're a priest and if you're relying on parishioners coming through the doors you don't want to take on popular stances that might make some of them stay at home we had an issue with an example since we're talking about the church last year uh in county kerry in ireland where a priest stood up at, at a sermon at a, i think it was a confirmation and actually spoke out uh, about the church's views on uh, homosexuality, abortion, and divorce, I think it was. I, I, mm -hmm. I've been watching, uh, people walked out of the church. Um, mm -hmm. So some of his parishioners walked out in disgust that they were hearing ca ca Catholic teaching in a Catholic church. Um, and then his bishop apologized on his behalf. His yeah. bishop apologized See, but, you know, for, the, for the offensive yeah. teaching in the church. So that's the environment in which these guys are operating. In the bishop church. apologized. I mean, I mean, the, the 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 smart thing to do there. I mean, the, the bishop apologized. I mean, that is that is amazing and shocking, and and stupid. I mean, the smart thing to say, or the re, you know, the really smart thing to say is, don't let the door hit you on the way out, and don't come back for for confirmation unless for your next child, unless uh, you are prepared to. Mm -hmm. support the, the principles of the catholic church and you're going to have a stronger church a stronger a smaller but stronger church and that will send out a beacon of strength and light to 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 people around you who you know you know there's a mental health crisis apparently um, in young people and and older people in ireland and you know they might be they might be grateful for some meaning they might be grateful for some strength and by the way the catholic church is very rich it has a lot of land and a lot of assets um, you know, uh, spending that money, strengthening the church that exists and building on it from a position of strength, isn't that a better way than, than, than losing everyone uh, because you believe in nothing? Well, it's probably what I do if I was running the church, but I'm not running the church. Yes. All I can do is observe that what they are presently doing does not seem to be working because, I mean, I, 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 no. I, I know a lot of Catholics and... I would say that of the, the Catholics I know, those who are true, sincere believers, maybe 10%. But in Ireland, we have a huge tradition of cultural Catholicism. People who go to Mass because it's what they've always yeah. done. They want the church funeral. They want the church wedding. They want the church baptism. They want the first communion and the confirmation. And they want the priest to shut their mouth and only say nice things. And that, that is just the, yes. the, the society in which we live. Um, and I don't know, I think, because I've spent a fair bit of time in the States, uh, and I think the the average Catholic parish over there, I know it's patchy as it is everywhere, but the average, yeah. average Catholic parish uh, that I ever encountered in the US is in much ruder health than the average Irish 
yeah. uh, parish on yeah. the on the primary basis that the people who go to church on a Sunday, most of them sincerely believe what they're listening to. Um, yeah. And I, yeah. I, I think uh, Irish people have a broader sense that there is a God and the church is the church. It's always been there. I don't think there's any really strong in, um, inculcated sense of Catholicism. And to bring it back to the point about Joe Biden, one of the things that, that's interesting about Joe Biden is, to me, watching him, and I know this, I don't want to offend anyone because I know I know, I know there's a lot of people who say his, uh, rightfully that he's not a very good Catholic at all. But he's a more sincere believer, I think, in God than a lot of people who call themselves Irish Catholics. And I thought it was really interesting in that yes. he went to knock because no Irish politician would be seen dead there. And I mean that literally. He wouldn't, <laughs> he wouldn't be seen dead. Very um, good point. Very um, good he, point. He actually, he actually he, so Biden still sees, what's interesting is Biden still sees, even if you think it's just political value, he still sees some value in going to places yes. like knock and Marion Shrines. I mean, the Irish president, his counterpart, uh, though we, the Irish president, by the way, the figurehead, doesn't have any executive power. He yeah. sits in a big house we pay for and he writes bad poems. But he didn't even send out a message to the Irish people celebrating Easter recently. So we had Easter two weeks ago. Um, and you know, if it's Ramadan or if it's a Jewish yeah. high holiday or if it's a Hindu event, he quite rightly, and I have no objection to this, sends out uh, messages saying, you know, to all our citizens who are celebrating whatever the event uh -huh. is, um, you know, have a great time. Easter silence the nada i mean he, he and again he would be in he would make a point of not saying anything because catholicism yes. and not just catholicism christianity is seen as passe and one of the things yeah. you mentioned about uh the north and biden and all of that is that we look down the unionist community in northern ireland the, the protestant community one of the mm -hmm. reasons that we don't like them very much is that they are very devout they're very religious people um and there's yes. a sense down here that there's something they off about that um so, yeah, yeah. I, I, oh no, yeah, yeah. No, I mean, look, the unionists. I mean, yeah, they're 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 devout, they're sober. You know, they're they're industrious. Uh, but that, you're right, the devoutness and the loyal the loyalism. I was speaking. I was on the Mark Stein show recently, actually speaking about Joe Biden, and and he said, you know, the unionists in Northern Ireland, the more British they are, and the more British they behave, and the more they celebrate their Britishness and their Protestantism, the more the people, the the elites of of London look upon them with horror. Mm -hmm. So, the more they express their Britishness, the more they exp express their Protestantism to, to the, the elites in London. That's just further proof that they're just beyond the pale, right? And it's kind of what you're saying. They they look at them the same the same way they look at some fellow with a beer belly in Manchester who wears an England flag across his chest at the World Cup. I mean, That's that kind of thing horrifies people in London. I mean, yes. in, in, in Ireland, oddly enough, we don't have that. In Ireland, nationalism still exists. You still, like, the elites are not ashamed of the yes. Irish flag. Maybe the orange bit of it. But yeah, yes. Not, yes. Not, yes. But, but that is because in Ireland, nationalism is associated with the left. Uh, and, that's, and that's very interesting. In the U.S., Yes. And in the UK and in, 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 in a lot of other English-speaking countries, nationalism has always been seen as the preserve of the right. Yes. You know, it's a, yes. right wingers fly, yes. fly the national flag, left wingers fly the rainbow flag. In Ireland, mm. we fly, the left flies them both together. The, 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 nationalism is seen as progressive because it is set against Englishness, first of all. That's right. Um, and Englishness is always tradition, associated with being like, you know, Maggie Thatcher and the right wing and all of that yes. sort of stuff. And so, so in Ireland, there's no shame in nationalism, but in, in, in the UK and the US, and you see this is why the unionists in the North are so reviled by people in, by progressive elites in London, it's because they're nationalists. And that is another yes. reason I think if you, if you transpose that over to the US, that Trump's movement, whether you like it or not, is a nationalist movement. It is a make That's America great right. again, right. fly the flag movement. It appeals to the kind of people who love their God and love their country. Uh, and not yeah. the kind of people who talk, who think their country is a racist disgrace and a stain on the, the, the history of the yeah. planet. So, so it's all yeah. this, the, the culture war is at the heart of everything, really, I think. Yes. Yeah. Well, I mean, look, Brexit was a nationalist movement, mm -hmm. right? And Trump, Trump was a, a completely a nationalist movement, America first. And the, all these Irish progressives who are going to vote for Sinn Féin, the nationalist party next, at the next election, they would be horrified to think that they're part of some. It's a, actually it's a nationalist movement that is sweeping the world at the moment, or has been sweeping the world for the last ten years. It's a reaction against the establishment politicians, the establishment parties, and 
here in Ireland, they think that they think that the, the idea that they would have anything in common with with with, with Trump supporters or Brexit supporters, the horror. But there, it's the same movement, and this is the same. I don't know. Um, Ireland is a great follower of of international. I mean, I, I suppose we all are. But I mean, even Easter nineteen sixteen, you know, it was it's seen as the Irish Revolution. But like there was revolutions all over Europe at that time. You know, it was the Bolshevik Revolution. The, it was the Weimar uh, Revolution. I think in nineteen eighteen, they lived in revolutionary times. Eighteen forty eight, the revolution then. That was revolutionary times. I mean, the Irish people are not immune to the to the to the the swells of of international opinion but mm-hmm. i think i'd love to be somewhere i suppose they won't debate anymore but tell them look you're you're a part of a trumpian movement of nationalism of sweeping away the establishment political parties live with it yeah well they'd be horrified horrified at the very yes. thought of it you know but, but they, they see yeah. themselves much more in keeping with south american revolutionaries i mean if you ask Sinn fein who are they more, like donald trump or lula they would compare yes. themselves openly. And I mean, bear in mind, this is a party that supports. I mean, I want to make this point because Sinn Féin, for some reason, I'm sure you've got Irish American viewers who are conservatives and, you know, think of think of Ireland in romantic terms and think that Sinn Féin are the guys mm. who fight the Brits and want to reunify Ireland. This Sinn Féin mm. party um, eulogizes Fidel Castro. It sent people mm-hmm. to to uh, Venezuela to prop up the Bolivarian Revolution and Hugo Chavez. It has uh, it, it it has dealt arms dealt in dealt uh, with arms dealers in Bolivia. It was it had dealings with uh, Muammar Gaddafi in in sorry, 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 Bolivia and Muammar Gaddafi in Libya. These guys are in bed with every left wing revolutionary around the planet, with the possible exception of the North Koreans. Right. With, the, with the possible exception of North Koreans, there ain't been a radical left-wing organization around the world they haven't been in bed with. Or it, it, you know. And the only reason, can I just tell you, the only reason they didn't get into bed with the North Koreans was because the, uh, the official IRA got there before them. <laughs> and the INLA got No, so the, the, the official IRA sent, um, sent a delegation. They, were, they went to North Korea and trained there, and the INLA trained there and uh they didn't like it it was too austere you know but they were they, you know they went there to get the arm they, they they were in bed with FARC. they exchanged both uh weapons technology and personal technology mm-hmm. with FARC, the left-wing uh drug dealers in colombia as well so yeah and, um, and, 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 sorry just one last point on that because uh, i think it's fascinating mary lou mcdonald who is the leader of Sinn Féin and uh, if Sinn Féin get their way, the next Prime Minister of Ireland met with Joe Biden this week. She was delighted to be photographed with him. Now, her social media profile picture is not a picture of her. It is a picture of the Palestinian flag. She is she is up to her neck with the Palestinians. And here she was shaking hands eagerly with, with Israel's biggest ally uh, in the world. Mm-hmm. Um, and not 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 a mention of the hypocrisy. I mean, she didn't care. Didn't say they, well, she doesn't really believe this stuff. If it's to their advantage, no. like all left wingers, they will do whatever is necessary to advance the cause. But I mean, the idea that the United States has a friend in Sinn Fein, the United States should be very concerned about Sinn Fein because these guys want to go the way of Venezuela and Brazil and Bolivia and Cuba and every other South American basket case. Uh, they just want to do it in a Western country and they want to experiment on Irish people to do it. And I'm terrified that the Irish people are going to give them that chance. Well, I think I think they probably are. And for the same reason, by the way, and again, it gives me great pleasure to say this because they would hate it. The same reason that Donald Trump got a chance, they were just, they were just, people are just tired of electing people who, who, who are, who follow the same broken policies. Mm-hmm. I mean, there's no reason why Ireland, should have a housing crisis there there is no real reason for it like there should be no like there's plenty of land to build and there's plenty of cities and you know there's you know but but the policies of of regulation the policies of of planning uh uh, bans and planning and then the policies of, of of open borders uh and then you know uh, I, I, I mean, you know the reasons for the housing crisis, the policies of rent control. All of these are are tried and trusted soft left answers that the establishment parties have been pushing for twenty years, and and they are the cause of the problem, not not the not the solution to it. And uh, so, why wouldn't people vote for Sinn Féin the next time? 
Well, that and there's nowhere else. I mean, sometimes listening to this conversation when I'm describing Sinn Féin as the radical left, people might have the idea that there's a sort of quasi economically right wing Irish government. There isn't. I mean, our government is. No, there isn't. Is it's it's you know, conservatively, it's governed like um, Vermont, for example, or California. California is a great example. We are very we are governed essentially the same way California is. Mm-hmm. We have a very similar economic structure to California, where you've got a lot of high earners in the tech sector, you've got a big legal sector, you've got a huge sprawling public service, and you've got ordinary businesses that are small desperately trying to survive you've got a housing crisis you've got homeless people uh, everywhere you've got massive immigration issues uh, mm. and you've got a government whose only answer is more of the same please um and yeah. i guess like california is a good example because there's nothing gavin newsom can do wrong in california right Ga- gavin newsom no. gets it wrong in california the answer is going to be well he just wasn't progressive enough let's give it let's have a little bit of a harder dose they're never going to say well actually you know we, yeah, let's raise more money for to solve the problem uh, yeah. that was caused by money, our money. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So that's the cycle. We're so, in here. and and so that's where Joe Biden fit it in perfectly. Uh, well, listen, um, we could talk all day about this, but thank you very much for your time. Um, please come back on the show. Uh, where can people get you? What? How can they find you? Have a podcast yourself now? I see. I have a podcast myself now. It's very Irish. We talk about the week and the events that happened in Ireland. But if you are interested, it's normally pinned to the top of my Twitter feed, which is at John, J-O-H-N underscore McGurk, M-C-G-U-I-R-K. And if you want to read my work, it's at Gripped Media, which is sort of a, a website that we founded in Ireland. We're, we're, a pre, we're actually a full-scale media outlet now, members of the Irish Press Council, to try and balance the scales here. And that is Gripped, G-R-I-P-T dot I-E. And Phelan, thanks so much for having me on. It's always a delight. And thanks so much for the work you and Anne. And the whole team do out right there. Thank you, John. Thank you. So that's Gript Media, G R I P T dot I E, not government funded media. Uh, uh, just to let you let the people out there know, unlike most of the rest of the Irish media. John, thank you very much for the show. Uh, and for everyone watching out there, we'll be back with the Alan Phelan Scoop next week. Uh, thanks for watching. Bye. Hey.